Hello, and welcome again to my show, Searching for Integrity. My name really is John Smith, and I'm searching for people with integrity. Why? Because our country suffers from IDD, Integrity Deficit Disorder. We have as our guest today, Mr. Stephen Charkow, Charchow, a media and real estate investor with a book, Dangerous Authors with Books. Watch out. This one is the new Roaring Twenties, colon, A dot I in America. And you're going to get to tell me all about AI. I know zip about it. Well, I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. <laughs> I've, ha I've got a lot of notes here. I went everywhere. I've been everywhere, man. Um, and uh, you've done a lot. I've looked at your background and things that you do. Um, the other <coughs> items that I thought were in interesting to get out of the way is that uh, uh, you were uh, born in 51 and I was born in 48. And um, it was uh, so a surprise, but it's, it's not something that you don't meet many people your own age. Uh, so tell us about your book. Well, um, I uh, have been involved in uh, investing in real estate and in the motion picture and media business now for mm -hmm. the last 30, 35 years. And I've been friends with Paul Zane Pilzer, my co-author, uh, for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And Paul uh, had, a couple of years ago, started working on this book because of questions his children were asking about what the next 10 years might hold and what they should think about and plan to do. He has four children. Well, Paul was working on his book, and he and his wife called me and said that he was very seriously ill, and would I help him finish the book? And I said, of course. And uh, this last year, in 22, we finished it. Uh, it's just come out now, and uh, it's called The New Roaring Twenties, which is what Paul terms the next 10 years, and he compares it in the book to the last Roaring Twenties, and what happened there, you know, that was a period of great growth and uh, many excesses and a lot of controversy and problems, uh, but also an area that saw uh, an era that saw uh, the first uh, mass marketing, the first use of automobiles as a necessity rather than a luxury, telecommunications. Uh, it, it was really a big change for the country. And of course it ended with a terrible depression. Uh, now uh, we are in what could be termed the new roaring twenties. And this is being driven largely by technology and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, there's been a lot in the news recently about AI. You know, I own several businesses that use artificial intelligence in our business. Mm -hmm. Further, all of us have artificial intelligence as a part of our lives. AI is part of your cell phone, uh, your car, um, your uh, you know, experience with um, the internet, uh, with advertising. It's all uh, managed to a certain extent by AI. Um, it's not what you would call generative AI, which is what a lot of people are talking about right now, which functions autonomously and can in fact create content. This has not been the case previously, but now we're beginning to see that and it's uh, going to cause some very positive changes and, some, and influence our lives significantly, but there's also a danger to it. Well, the drums are rolling now. You, you end it with 
with the conclusion. Yeah, I, I don't know much about it, although I started using it. Sometimes whenever uh, uh, Mac, he's my uh, virtual guy and producer, he wants to me to be some financial guru, which I'm not. Um, however, that, that brings to point two. I saw you got a CPA. I was a CPA. Um, what else can we do together? Well, uh, I'm I'm overeducated. Uh, I have a law degree and I'm a CPA, and I have a master's degree in real estate, all from the University of Wisconsin. And I practice law for five years. And since that time, I've been involved in business. I was a partner in a large real estate company, and now, for the last uh, thirty years or so, I've been unemployed, uh, running my own businesses. And, um, you know, basically uh, in a position within reason of making my own choices. Uh, as you know from your own experience, when you have your own business, uh, it creates some flexibility and freedom, but it also uh, creates a variety of tough decisions, uh, both ethical and strategic as to the choices you make and you know, you try to make good choices. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. Um, and now we're in a time where a lot of choices may be taken out of our hands. Uh, artificial intelligence is going to uh, be pervasive over the next 10 years. And in many respects, it's going to be very positive. Uh, it's going to create uh, opportunities to diagnose medical conditions by accessing an unlimited amount of data regarding various diseases and specifically on the patient in question. It will help in diagnosing cancers and various other diseases, uh, probably extend um, our lives. Uh, longevity will be a factor in all this. Uh, there also are nanobots, which are very small robots, which currently are being used to perform surgery and are becoming increasingly autonomous, where they will evaluate how the body is functioning and what is going on and effectively make decisions during the surgical process in a way that a physician could not. Um, it, AI is going to speed up. Uh, and replace a lot of repetitive work. Uh, it may well uh, enhance and reduce the need for CPAs and for lawyers. Uh, it may not eliminate them completely. And there may also be a lot of litigation that will arise from the right. use of AI. But a lot of the repetitive tasks are gonna be performed by artificial intelligence. And it's gonna make it possible for accountants, lawyers, and other professionals to be much more efficient. It's also going to eliminate a lot of jobs. And uh, John Maynard Keynes 100 years ago predicted that by this time, by the, by the end of the new roaring 20s, 1930 to 1933, that uh, only about of the third of the population would be gainfully employed. And that means we have a huge transition ahead of us of people whose jobs are no longer functional within the economy. And what to do about that? How do you retrain them? How do you get them motivated? And most of all, how do you support them? And that leads to the possibility of a huge reform in our welfare and medical systems, which would include something called universal basic income, which would provide every American with a stipend to handle the transitions and the ups and downs of life uh, and crises that occur in all lives. And uh, part of the book deals extensively with proposed reforms in that regard, because right now we have a social welfare system and a medical care system that is at least in part broken. Right. And 
a lot of work needs to be done in that regard. And frankly, artificial intelligence will help us. Well, what would they do? I mean, aside from the medical side of it and pharmacy, that type of thing. Um, go ahead. I'm, I'm listening now. Well, first of all, uh, it's going to dramatically improve the quality and the security of our infrastructure. Right now, uh, we are very vulnerable uh, to attacks uh, by hackers, either right. government oriented or individuals. And we're, there's something called zero days, which is a software vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And we as a, as a country, our, our uh, clandestine services are very skilled in using zero days, but Russia and China are as well. And the zero day basically means that you have no time to solve a software vulnerability. AI will, as a matter of course, patch and repair those vulnerabilities in real time in ways that humans could not. Um, I think that uh, AI will have a role to play in dealing with climate change and will help us manage and predict what's going to happen more effectively by having access to an extraordinary amount of data. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is a dual purpose item. Uh, and a lot of things are dual purpose. Humans are dual purpose. Uh, we can do good things or bad things. Fire is dual purpose. Uh, atomic energy is dual purpose. And AI is similarly dual purpose. And while it can improve our lives and improve our wealth considerably, um, it also has the capacity to arbitrarily make decisions, particularly as it becomes autonomous, that can affect humans and do harm to humans. Um, and it doesn't even need to be sentient or have emotions or have feelings of its own. It just needs to function autonomously. We already have... Uh, uh, military applications of autonomous AI. We're seeing it in the drone warfare in Ukraine right now. This is probably the first drone uh, war. And uh, our military has said that we're not going to have any weapon system that can function without human command. But that's not going to be the case in a number of other countries, specifically Russia. And uh, the problem there is uh, one of the reasons we are secure is that our military is the strongest in the world and the best. And if we do not have autonomous weapon systems, which are incredibly dangerous to us right. as humans, uh, we're not going to be able to compete militarily. And so there's going to be a real dilemma. And there is, you know, more than a zero chance that as AI grows stronger and stronger, that it will become an existential crisis. And we, it may find that it really doesn't need humans. And our time on this planet could well be limited due to that. Right. You're talking now about a guy named Harold, I think, in a movie that... Um was one of the ones that uh, was more capable than humans. Let me ask you this. Um, is it basically just a database and a way to get to it sooner than later? Is that is there some, the simple definition of it? Well, um, that's a good start, and that's certainly a big part of it. Uh, it is the ability to access data. Um, and without the internet, we wouldn't be talking about this right. because it uses effectively the internet and other networking systems to gather that data. But what happens, um, and the technologists who have developed artificial intelligence, and there are about uh, a couple hundred 
uh, different systems with chat GPT being the one that's gotten the most recognition so far because it's an open software, meaning it's available. I mean, you can go on the internet and use chat GPT if you want to, to answer questions, and help you research various things. But what happens with artificial intelligence, it begins to simulate the human intelligence and not only gathers the data, but acts on it and connects the dots between, you know, literally uh, hundreds of millions of pieces of data well beyond any human capability. I mean, I can't remember what I had for lunch today, I mean, but the artificial intelligence, the, the machines will remember everything they ever did and the actions they're taking now. And in fact, they'll remember everything that humans have ever done that shows up on the internet. So they have the ability to not only gather the data and create you know, an, an enormous database, but also uh, the ability to manipulate that data and make decisions in real time as to what should be done with that data. And some of those decisions are very good for us and are gonna be incredibly helpful. Some of them could be catastrophic. Um, you know, there's a movie out right now that I enjoyed seeing on Sunday morning, uh, which is Oppenheimer, um, uh -huh. which is about the atomic bomb and the process mm -hmm. of developing it and the central character, uh, Oppenheimer. And he was faced with a real dilemma because there was a greater than zero chance that when the bomb was exploded uh, in New Mexico, that it would ignite the atmosphere and destroy the whole planet. And he conferred with Albert Einstein and others, and they felt it was a risk worth taking um, although the issues were complex. And so they went ahead and detonated. And with respect to AI, there's more than a zero chance that uh, this is the beginning of the end for humanity. Uh, you know, we, we need to regulate it. Uh, we need to have guardrails. Um, we need to uh, study carefully and eat. You know, all of us need to try to be somewhat informed, even if technology and AI is not our natural milieu. Um, we need to know as much as we can, and we need to encourage our regulators and our legislators to understand it as best they can, which is a tricky thing because, um, you know, members of Congress are not known for their ability to understand and effectively deal with these issues, but they kind of have to now. Uh, this, is, this is a big deal and the threat is very real and uh, they need to understand how they can use it and also you know, what the dangers are and what the destructive potential of all this is. Because you know, yeah, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're gonna sort that out and deal with it. But I also recognize that uh, this could be it for us. <laughs> and right. We, right. we need to be conscious of that fact. Well, there, there are all kinds of bad guys out there. Uh, countries that are labeled bad guys. And I would guess that they would be the number one target in order to reach some sort of agreement, ha, 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 about whether or not it ought to be worldwide. So what do we do with that? What, well, that's an excellent, it's an excellent question. And um, I've had uh, discussions and debates with technologists and people who are even who are more familiar with the with artificial intelligence than than I am. And there's a real difference of opinion. I mean, there are some that feel the genie's out of the bottle, you can't regulate it. Um, other countries are not really going to regulate it. They'll do it, whatever they can do as fast as they can do it. I mean, Putin has said that whoever understands AI controls the world. 
And Chairman, actually President Xi uh, in China has uh, you know, said that this is the top priority for his country. It is more important than any other technology or any other uh, mission that his country might have. So they're clearly all over this. And um, uh, there is a point of view that we cannot regulate this in our country because we will not be able to compete. Um, the other point of view is, you know, um, we can only do what we can do. It's like the issues faced by e each of us as humans. We can only control what we control, and it ain't much that we really control. But we can do what we can do, and we are a democracy, and we at least can manage this so it doesn't destroy us internally. And other countries will do whatever they're going to do. And quite frankly, they may end up getting destroyed by this or having it out of control. But I fall on the side of uh, regulation, uh, careful regulation, thoughtful regulation, and a discussion, a democracy like we have um, is a, a conversation. It's a discussion. It's the stories we tell one another. That's the basis for democracy. It's also the, the basis for religion, and it's the basis for money. You know, money right now is largely a digital currency. It's a series of, of zeros and ones. It's, it's not the cash and you have in your pocket for the most part. And that's a story that we, we tell each other and that we believe. Um, you know, stories are so important and language is so important. And perhaps the danger is not that AI will attack us in some way or uh, cause violence, is that we may reach a point where our stories are being told not by other humans, mm -hmm. but by artificial intelligence, uh, you know, effectively a non-human alien source. And that may um, characterize and affect how we tell our own stories because now we're getting a totally different story. Imagine um, how one's, how the Bible or one's religion might be, might be different if it was coming from a machine rather than you know, human history. Uh, that's a very different story and may well influence um, how we behave and, you know, the control that we have or do not have in our lives. And I kind of think that the nature of story and the fact that the stories may change may, in fact, be the big risk as compared with some sort of, you know, destructive event where all the humans are killed or something like that. Although, you know, that's also a possibility. And there was a recent test that was done uh, with AI by uh, scientists uh, at a major university, and they were trying to uh, study the various molecular combinations that AI could come up with to cure disease. And they reversed the directions and said, create the multiple molecular combinations that are toxic and can kill humans. And they ended up with 40,000 plus combinations of molecules that were harmful. You know, that in the wrong hands, you know, is a roadmap to biological warfare and all kinds of other risks that while the machines are creating the formula, it's basically what humans are venting on each other at that point. So those are the kinds of risks. And that doesn't mean that we should stop AI because it's too late for that. It's already here. But it does mean that, in my opinion, we need to regulate. We need to understand. All of us need to educate ourselves in whatever way we can so we can speak about this subject coherently. Um, you know, there's so much I don't know about right. this but I'm working all the time in my businesses, as well as in general, 
um, to uh, to try to understand it. There's there's a really good podcast called the AI Breakdown, which is 15 minutes every day, and just summarizes what's going on in AI at that time. And I find that if I listen to that, and then uh, research some of the questions that are raised, and even some of the terminology, that really helps me a great deal. Well, it would help me uh, just to get along. Um, let me uh, thank you for being our guest. And uh, my listeners, my audience, wants to hear about how they can find the book. Well, uh, the book is, of course, uh, can be purchased online through Amazon and Walmart and all the various online uh, services. And then it's currently in Barnes and Noble and it's in um, a lot of independent bookstores. You know, I, I'm a great believer in supporting uh, small and independent bookstores, a little bit of a dying breed. Mm -hmm. uh, I love wandering through them. So I would urge anyone interested in the book to, you know, seek out their local bookstore and chances are they'll have it. Well, I hope so. Um, a lot of authors would, like, would be happy. Um, you know, we have listeners out there that I believe really like the searching for integrity. I had that a lot of good comments on that. Just I let people open open your brain and share it with everybody. That's that's you. That's one of those people. Um, I uh, I'm sorry. I said thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, you're very welcome. I'm glad to see you here there. And and. After after forty something years, I, I feel uh, I, like I owe you something. I not, don't know him yet, but uh, you're easily to get along with some. And uh, being in Texas as I have, and being long term, uh, this was a California uh, saying that uh, so long and happy trails to all until we meet again. Mm -hmm.